Well, good morning, everybody. My name is David Kennedy, and if I have any standing, standing here at all or any claim on your attention, it rests on two facts or factoids. Uh, I was the founding director of the Bill Lane Center for the American West, which is the organizer and sponsor of this event. And also, it's the case that I grew up in Washington State. And I've spent the last week here back in my home state. And I snowmobiled up to the headwaters of the Chihuahua River to the mining camp where my parents worked in the 1920s and 30s. And I went to my summer place on San Juan Island for a few days. And then I went, enjoyed the hospitality of Martha Wyckoff and Jerry Tone. We floated the Yakima River yesterday. We actually caught a few fish. And here we are in Yakima. <laughs> So I feel very much at home. Now the fact is, I've been fated to live in California for the last 51 years. Uh, but I still have a deep attachment to this region. And I often reflect on a story about the Oregon Trail pioneers who came out west in the 1840s. And the story goes that <coughs> where the Oregon Trail, then known as the Pacific Trail, crossed South Pass, Wyoming, the Continental Divide, uh, the trail forked just west, just this side of South Pass, and the left-hand fork went down to the California gold fields, and the right-hand fork came up here to the Oregon country. And so the story goes, the Californians, at great labor and cost, hauled a wagon load or two of low-grade gold-bearing ore back up the California branch of the trail and built a rock cairn a few feet down the left-hand fork so that all people coming along after them would know this way the gold fields of California. The Oregonians, being more prosaic folks, simply put up a sign, pointed up the right fork of the trail, and it said, to Oregon. And we think up here, the result of that differential signage was that everybody who came along the trail who could read went to Oregon. <laughs> you can take that back with you. <laughs> so. <laughs> This uh, conference is the sixth uh, Eccles family conference on the rural west. The Eccles family, of course, are from Utah, and they've been very, very generous supporters of the Lane Center in general and of this conference in particular. The concept for a, an initiative at our center concerning the rural west uh, originated a little less than a decade ago when we noticed that the year 2009 marked the centenary of a very famous publication uh, called The Report of the Country Life Commission, commissioned by Theodore Roosevelt, and the report was actually published in the last year, or last few weeks, actually, of his presidency in 2009. The report was commissioned in the wake of what I'm sure everybody in this room will remember as the populist upheavals of the late 19th century. And when all is said and done, at the end of the day, what that populist revolt, so-called, was all about was a, uh, a politicized expression of discontent uh, from the rural west and the rural south against the increasing urbanized industrial power of the northeast. Uh, and Theodore Roosevelt decided to try to gather some scientific or empirically reliable data about exactly what was going on in the American countryside. And he commissioned an economist at Cornell with the colorful name of Liberty Hyde Bailey to conduct this survey. And uh, they, they did it in what today I suppose we would regard as rather a crude manner. They sent out by mail, uh, rural free delivery, <laughs> mail uh, questionnaires to people all over the rural parts of America. And they had something like a 42 or 43 percent response rate, which is truly extraordinary. And from that they compiled this report. So when we read the report 100 years later, we were struck by something because the report uh, uses a little bit peculiar vocabulary. It talks about what it regards as the deficiencies, that's the term they used, the deficiencies of life in rural America or in the American countryside. Uh, and as we read the list of deficiencies, it was stunning actually how you could make up the exact same list today. Uh, population drain, inadequate access to communications, inadequate access to education, inadequate access to transportation, high priced goods, higher, higher, more highly priced than in the urban centers of the East, and so on and so on and so on. Inadequate ac access to credit, 
inadequate access to health care. The list went on and on, and you could have compiled almost precisely the same list today. So that was the origin of this initiative, to undertake the study what's going on in the rural west today, since our brief has to do with the western part of the continent. Uh, and out of that uh, thinking grew this series of conferences, this being the sixth. And as you will hear uh, later today, uh, though I don't need to tell people in this room, there's a whole host of issues that are urgent in the uh, rural American West. I've just named some of them. We'll be discussing some of them through the day. But one that we have anointed <laughs> as our priority is rural health care. And uh, Phil Polikoff is here, and I know he'll be talking about that later, as will others. And we are hoping uh, in the years ahead uh, to organize at and through Stanford a region-wide effort to really focus on improving wellness and health care in the rural parts of uh, the American West. So that's how I got here, uh, from Seattle to Palo Alto, back to Yakima. And uh, that's how we organize this particular kind of a gathering here today. So I want to welcome you all. I want to say a particular thanks to Martha Wyckoff and Jerry. Martha is on our advisory council and had a role in putting all this thing here together for us today. And I hope we're going to have a very productive and interesting uh, day's worth of discussion about uh, the rural American West. So thank you all for being here. And I'm going to turn it over to Bruce Kane. <laughs> Bruce is not only my successor on this platform, he, was, he is my successor as the director of the Bill Lane Center for the American West at Stanford. So it gives me particular compound pleasure to say welcome, Bruce. <laughs> thank you. All right. I, I too want to uh, offer my um, welcome to the people that are here for this conference uh, this year, and also to acknowledge uh, people who have worked hard to help put this together, um, people that are in Washington and people that are in California. So uh, like uh, Professor Kennedy, I want to acknowledge Martha and Jerry um, for their help in thinking about this area, and Phil Polikoff for his work on the health panels that are coming up, and David Kennedy himself for his participation in this, and of course to Hope Eccles who uh, has funded this whole rural health um, emphasis. She unfortunately couldn't be here, but she did come down for an earlier conference that we did a couple months ago on rural health, so uh, I think she uh, has uh, already been active and uh, participatory on the projects that we're going to talk about today. But uh, particularly this year, every year I, I try to affiliate with a, a university or a, an institution uh, so that we can have a partner that actually knows what they're doing in whatever state we're in. And uh, this year I turned to a former student of mine who is now a distinguished professor and associate dean at the Evans School in UW, uh, and that is uh, Craig Thomas. So it, it's a real pleasure, uh, A, to see my graduate students become far more distinguished than me, and secondly, to, uh, to work with them later on. So I'm really pleased that we could work with Craig. He came last year, and we were able to sort of think about the themes, and I'll talk about that in a second. I also want to thank our local partner, uh, the, uh, the Ruckles House Center, and Michael Kern in particular, who will be uh, helping us um, with, uh, who help guide the program in the theme of collaboration that I want to talk about in a second. And then especially our BLC staff, uh, uh, John Doherty. Uh, where's John? John's been doing uh, yeoman's work on this, and we appreciate it. He has another job, but he does this uh, on the side for us, and we appreciate it. We have a new events manager, Stephanie Burbank, that we threw right into the, uh, right into the mix, and we want to thank Stephanie. And uh, all the moderators and the panel. Uh, the Stanford alums that have shown up, we really appreciate your coming, and to the Yakima Convention uh, Bureau for the So let me talk a little bit about, David gave you kind of a background of how we got to having a Rural West program, and uh, I must say, living in the bubble of uh, Palo Alto and Stanford, I think there probably is no more valuable program in terms of getting Stanford out of the bubble and making it more of a regional collaborator with all the wonderful universities that are on the West Coast. Uh, Harvard, for whatever reason, does this way better than uh, almost any other elite institution, and I think all the rest of the research uh, institutions need to think much more broadly about how they can uh, 
collaborate with different states. There's lots of great work being done, lots of great people that are out here that know a ton about what's going on on the ground and uh, have done good studies. And uh, these partnerships, I think, are quite fruitful. We've done a number of them, as David mentioned before. And I think initially it started out as kind of more of a listening tour that is trying to figure out what's, what's exactly going on. If we're living in the bubble of urban, suburban, Palo Alto, we read about uh, rural issues, but we don't necessarily experience them or see them on a daily basis. And so the question is, you know, um, what did we learn in our listening tour? And I think as we, uh, we moved around from New Mexico to uh, Montana, we've been in Utah, um, as we've moved around to the different states, I think what we've discovered is that there are some recurring issues in all these states, uh, issues about land management, issues about rural health, what we'll talk about. But there's a broader theme um, that uh, I think relates to both the health issues and some of the, uh, if you like, climate change issues, and that is how does our Western region come together to deal with problems largely related to climate change, but not completely, of um, collaboration, of working together. Uh, we talk about the West as if it's a region. In reality, it's a lot of states, and it's a lot of different special districts. It's a lot of fracture um, forms of government. And over time, we've seen that that fracture has gotten worse with the polarization in American politics. And so when we see that uh, in the 2016 election that there are lots of people that have been left behind in terms of globalization or in terms of the automation and the changes in the economy, uh, that not everybody is a beneficiary of some of the high-tech innovation that's taken place, it wasn't a complete surprise to me or to David or to any of us that have been to these conferences that there was an enormous amount of disaffection out there, that, pe that people had high levels of drug use, that people were, not, were in opportunity wastelands that were not unlike the opportunity, job opportunity wastelands that you see in urban areas. And so to me, I think the, uh, when we, we also do something called a, a uh, essentially a sophomore college where we take students on a field trip and our last field trip uh, here was here in, uh, on the Columbia. We did the Columbia River uh, and it struck me in the last two trips that we've taken up here in the Northwest that when you leave Seattle or when you leave Portland and you get onto the rural areas, all of a sudden you were seeing Trump signs everywhere. It was just very dramatic and you go, whoa, I mean it's like a matter of just a few miles and all of a sudden the culture shifts like that. And the same thing could be said in uh, California. If you leave uh, the environs of uh, the Bay Area or Los Angeles and you get onto the Central Valley, uh, similarly, there's a shift. Not as dramatic because the state is, I think, uh, 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 if you like, uh, uh, the Central Valley has become, has had a lot more of out migration from uh, the Bay Area and Los Angeles uh, with exurb growth, and that has kind of uh, somewhat softened the divide between the East and West in California, but nonetheless there are the same kind of common tensions throughout the whole West. And so the, the question is, you know, how do we deal with this fracture? Now let me say a little bit more about the fracture. I mean the bottom line is that the American government was designed with Donald Trump in mind. Founding fathers anticipated Donald Trump. In fact that was their total total, I would say, their total focus. I mean, they had majority tyranny and minority tyranny, but I think they were really concerned as much as anything about the autocrat that would arise. And so right from the start, there was a strong populist feature to American government. I, we were going to just make it very hard for anybody to have concentrated power. And so we start American government that way, but then you get to the West, and suddenly you have center periphery tensions because you've got areas that are completely remote from the federal government, okay? So you add on uh, center periphery tensions. You add on a culture of individualism that comes with the kinds of people that are going to leave a civilized society in the East and come West, okay? Uh, that then is romanticized and, and developed into a culture that we talk about in our American West class. And you see that in many ways Western culture accentuates the kind of fractured suspicion of centralized power 
that underlies the American government. It just is stronger the further away from that centralized power. And that's true in France and lots of other places, but uh, there's a kind of, uh, I think, strengthening of this notion that power has to be, um, you have to suspect that power. And the irony, of course, is the federal government, we have this wonderful chart that we show the students in our American West class about how much of the land is owned by the federal government. So uh, 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 we, we layer on top of this generalized suspicion of centralized power that you see in many democracies. And we, then on top of that, because of the nature of public lands, we have a lot of public ownership of those lands, which is just layered on top of this underlying <laughs> populist suspicion and the, the governmental fracture. So basically what I'm getting at is that the legacy of that is a fracture of government into states and into counties, into cities, into special districts, into states that are red states, states that are blue states, cities that are blue states, within red states, uh, areas uh, in, uh, in red states that are very blue, you know, around university towns, et cetera. So we have this um, highly fractured setting and yet our challenges require that we think on a regional basis. So we're highly fractured into a localized structure where we're suspicious of centralized power, but the reality is to deal with our problems of climate change or healthcare, we have to overcome all these institutional barriers that we've put in. And, and, they, and we understand, particularly in this current era, why we have those barriers. We can't let them go because the reality is that if concentrated power is still a serious question, right? There are still people that would abuse that. So the question then is, we can't go, we can't change even if we wanted to, to a more centralized system. Uh, so the question is, how do we work with what we've got, the raw material of what we've got, to create um, a more collaborative uh, governance? And here I use the word governance, because governance doesn't just involve formal structure, it involves citizens, and nonprofits, and how do we bring them all together to work in a collaborative fashion from the grassroots up, and that's hard. That's really hard. Now, why do we have to do it? Well, let's just take climate change, and let's talk about the challenges that our states uh, face with respect to climate change. First of all, something that's less of a concern in Seattle, although in certain parts of Seattle it's a problem, is sea level rise. I mean, I gather it's, uh, Craig has convinced me that it's not as serious a problem as it is in the Bay. Uh, the Bay Area, you have relatively uh, shallow bay, that will flood, um, it floods already under regular storms, but now with sea level rise could flood even more. You have airports, uh, you have wastewater facilities, you have power plants that all could be knocked out, uh, a la Houston, if you have a storm combined with sea level rise. And if you get a cataclysmic sea level rise from an iceberg coming all the way off uh, Antarctica, then you're talking about fairly substantial amounts of flooding that will intrude into a lot of property, intrude on top of the highways, et cetera. So you would think that a state that 60 or 75 percent of the people believe that climate change is real and the consequences is something you have to deal with, you would think that the state of California would be on top of sea level rise. Wrong. Not happening. Not because of polarization. Not because of Donald Trump. Not because of the Tea Party but because of good old-fashioned procrastination and inertia, what we call collective action problems, okay? Or discounting of future benefits in political science talk. But it doesn't matter. It's procrastination. It's inertia. And how do you overcome that? Well, it's really hard. And the same story can be told and will be told, I'm sure, over the next uh, eight hours or so about drought, about fires, you know, about health care. I mean, it, they're just... Now, there are lots of good stories, and part of it is trying to figure out what the good stories are and what you learn from those stories. No story is completely good, so we expect there will be some disagreements about good stories, but uh, there are lessons to be learned from that, and that's part of what we're trying to do. We tried in California with respect to our water issues, which are severe as a result of climate change, we established a program called um, Integrated uh, Regional Water Management uh, Program that uh, was enacted through a series of bonds and some statutes. And the bottom line is that it had some successes and it had a lot of failures. And it combined three sort of steps. One was to 
try to actually create regional organizations uh, around hydrologically sensible areas. Uh, and the second was to give out grants uh, and, uh, and, and try to induce people to work together. And in some cases it did, in some cases it didn't, and maybe we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Another uh, area that, um, of potential ways to get people to collaborate is through the regulatory process, through the permitting process. But we're discovering with the fires, and maybe uh, we'll talk about this later, that despite the devastating fires that occurred in California, and despite the fact that many people are either living too close to wilderness areas or are not taking the proper steps to protect themselves, uh, that um, instead of forcing people to rethink whether they should be living there, instead of putting in uh, extraordinary requirements, we're basically giving them permits to rebuild what they lost completely. Okay? So that window of opportunity that comes with calamity, which usually create, creates the conditions under which you can get people to do something extraordinary, is kind of being wasted. <laughs> Now, I understand that out of reasons and compassion, but it is something that we have to think about because it's a real moral hazard problem if we're going to let people live without the proper protection, without the proper, um, you know, uh, whether it's flood insurance or whether it's uh, some kind of protection, whether they're living close to a sea level rise area, or whether they're close to a wilderness area that they shouldn't be, there's a moral hazard problem about simply saying, hey, look, if you lose it, we'll give it back to you. Uh, without any changes, and we need to really sort of think about that. So what I'm hoping is that as we go through today, we will look at what it is that creates collaboration. There's not going to be a simple recipe, but there are going to be tools that we can think about. Some of these are tools of information, some of them are tools of uh, influence, and some of them are tools of coercion. Uh, but somehow we have to really figure out what it is that creates this kind of collaboration. So that's my hope, is that out of this um, out of this session, the sessions that will start to evolve, A, a thought, about, and, and, uh, a thought about how these tools operate, but also to see that some of these problems with respect to drought and fire spill across state lines. It's not just collaboration within the state, it's across the states. If there are fires in Washington, that smoke is, gonna go, is not going to stay inside the, uh, the state lines, okay? Uh, and uh, per the rises in particular matter and, uh, that I'm sure people will talk about in the next session, these are really serious, they have serious health consequences for people. So how do we deal with that? And, uh, and then, you know, there are just lots of uh, problems with respect to water use that are not only across our states but are across our the borders of, our, uh, of Canada and, and uh, particularly now Mexico. And so we've invited one of the scholars who's come down to, uh, and worked with us on water energy issues on the border. But th those are very serious, uh, those issues as well as a result of climate change. So it's collaboration within states, it's collaboration across states of the West, and it's a collaboration across the region of the West, which includes Canada and includes Mexico. So obviously we're not going to do all these things comprehensively. We're just going to really sort of focus as much as we can on what are the sort of useful ways to think about collaboration. So with that, uh, I will stop and uh, we will invite up the first panel, which is chaired by Professor Brady. Thank you very much.